it's my great pleasure to introduce you to someone who uh, someone who goes back to the Ronald Reagan administration as one of the chief architects of the missile defense system and has been a patriot throughout his life serving our country. And more recently, uh, he has been talking to uh, people that come to this convention about the dangers of, to our electrical grid through EMP. And, um, and now he ha has uh, a project going with the states that, uh, well, I'm going to let him tell you about that. But a great American, please w give a warm welcome to Ambassador Henry Cooper. Thank you all. It's uh, great to be with you all this morning, and I really appreciate uh, Joe's invitation to let me come back and share what I hope will be seen as some good news. We've still got a long way to go in working uh, the problems I've talked to you about before, but I've got some progress report which I hope will, you will find to be of interest. Um, see, can I have the first chart just so that I know I'm oriented. I'll be talking with you uh, from the charts. Um, I don't intend to read the charts to you. I put a briefing together which we will post on our web page, uh, which is highfrontier.org if you wish to go there. And my son Scott passed out on the way in, if, uh, depending on when you came in, uh, a, a little brochure that we passed out uh, back in March with the South Carolina, um, I guess it was National Security Summit, we call it. High Frontier joined with the Center for Security Policy and Breitbart to put this on in Columbia. And we talked about our challenges for South Carolina there and what we hope to do. And I'm going to give you a progress report on that today. Before I start, I intend to use the, go ahead to the first chart. I intend to use uh, the figures on the chart. Uh, I don't intend to try to read the chart, and I don't necessarily uh, encourage you to read the chart. But before I start, I'd just like to ask a few questions. How many of you understand what EMP is? Just raise your hands. Good. That's good. That's, <laughs> that's the response I got last year, and it was a welcome surprise. So I'm not surprised this year, and I'm pleased that, uh, that you understand that nature of the threat. Do you understand that the cyber threat is also a threat to our electric grid and to your security? How about the physical threat? The, uh, you know, guys, terrorists that can make their way into critical substations and take down at least major components of the grid. Do you understand that? Okay, good. Well, I won't dwell on that. On this particular chart is a number of pictures um, one that you may or may not know about, you all know who Ted Koppel is, okay? Uh, I'm very pleased that he has written a book called Lights Out, which describes the problem. And he actually reports on all of the threats to the grid. Um, he chose to focus on the cyber portion of the threat because he understands that. He, uh, uh, and he appreciates the uh, seriousness of the problem, as do most people. Uh, and I think that's great. The one thing that I'm disappointed in is that when he talked about the EMP threat, uh, subsequent to the report coming out, and when people asked him, I think Frank asked me, asked him on his uh, radio show why he didn't uh, focus on EMP. And he said he thought that uh, that would, like in the Cold War, not really ever happen because we would uh, deter anybody who would to attack us this way and just destroy them with retaliation. Now, I don't agree with that assessment, uh, but it is a common one, I have to tell you. We have, uh, if you watched the debate earlier this week, uh, several of the uh, candidates for president, notably Rick Santorum, who was here yesterday, and Ben Carlson, who is here today, noted EMP is a major problem. 
And uh, almost immediately, the Washington Post came out with uh, an article uh, poo-pooing that and uh, basically arguing that that was much overstated and uh, no one would dare attack us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have to remember, as we are confronting an issue, a threat, in which uh, some of our adversaries are quite willing to commit suicide, as we know, to kill us. And they repeatedly say, uh, death to America, you know, as a part of the Iran deal, which I gather, if it's not uh, underway now, is imminent. Terrible, terrible uh, deal, as others have said. I don't intend to elaborate on that. And the, uh, the leadership of Iran, Khomeini, the Ayatollah, you know, I, I have no confidence whatsoever that he would not when he gets a nuclear weapon and is comfortable in carrying out the attack and what would come after, except the idea that many Iranians would die as a consequence of him killing 90% of all of the Americans. Kill, kill America, that's, that's what he said he wants to do. I take him seriously. And I think we all should. The uh, other point to be made about the issue of EMP that one day, we're going to be confronted with a major pulse that comes from the sun. That's the point of the right-hand chart there. Ted Koppel's books in the middle, the, uh, the National Geographic article, talks about uh, the uh, coronal mass ejections that come periodically from the sun. Are you aware that uh, earlier this year, we missed by less than a week such an occurrence that would potentially take down the entire grid, not only of the United States, but other nations around the world, happen. One of the bits of good news is that the, the powers that be recognize the solar threat. And there is now a strategy that's been put out by the White House to address the threat of the solar uh, emissions to the grid. And so there is an attempt to begin working on that prob problem in a serious way. Uh, regrettably, they're not talking about the nuclear component of the EMP threat. And on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll see the, uh, the uh, newspaper from Hawaii the day after Starfish Prime in 1962 when we discovered just how damaging EMP could be. It was a high-altitude burst. Uh, I think one and a half megatons, that's a million tons of TNT equivalent, if you, um, you're not familiar with the term, of energy detonated some 200 miles above the, Earth's, uh, above the Earth, above the Earth's atmosphere. And it turned out the lights in Hawaii. It also caused catastrophic damage. Some people poo this too. And that was part of the article in the Washington Post earlier this week. Um, and uh, they don't mention the fact that uh, it knocked out several of our uh, neophyte satellite systems. When I worked at Bell Laboratories in the early 1960s, I was part of the team that launched this Telstar. Are you familiar? Does anybody remember Telstar? It was our first telecommunication satellite. Uh, when you think about today's technology and that technology, we used two 300-ton uh, horn antennas, one in outside of Paris, and one um, in Rumford, Maine, uh, to make the very first television transmission from Europe to the United States. And my wife, Bobby, and I went into a small room, much smaller than this, to watch that first transmission. Still one of the real honors of my life. Nevertheless, as I recall, we lost six or seven of our beginning communications and surveillance satellite systems on that uh, event. Some of it was uh, immediate loss. Some of it was the satellites died as a consequence of uh, radiation that was emitted from this particular event. Now, today's world, you're dependent. You know, how many have, uh, you know, the, uh, depend on the little gadgets in your car for helping you find where you're going? A lot of you do, right? GPS, right? That's satellite system, you understand. The uh, cell phones uh, that we use don't necessarily go through satellites. They go through towers, but we're dependent on them. Um, and if we lose uh, electricity, generally so, we lose 
practically everything we depend on. Now, <clears throat> across the bottom of the pictures is a schematic of the Metcalf substation just outside of San Jose, California. Uh, in 2013, I believe it was April or so, 2013, uh, persons unknown still went into the underground for that facility, cut the cables, uh, and then in addition uh, fired using AK-47s to destroy the transformers there. And they came within cutting one wire of shutting down all of Silicon Valley. Now, John Wellinghoff, who led the Federal Emergency uh, uh, Energy Regulatory Commission, resigned in protest because the, the fact that that commission was not dealing with the issues, because he said at the time that they had done studies in which they determined that nine of the thousands of such substations around the nation, if they were taken out, would take down the entire electric grid for 18 months. That was published in the Wall Street Journal, uh, a notable, credible uh, source of information, several articles on it. You can Google and, and look it up if you like. Got into a lot of trouble because this was a allegedly official use only information for government eyes only. But uh, Wellinghoff felt so strongly about this that he made it public. So the bottom line of all this is we have a major problem uh, as I said, at least we're beginning to address the issue at the senior government levels, even including the White House, uh, for the solar problem. The big issue there is if you, if you solve the solar problem, you're still left with the other because one component of the EMP pulse is a long wavelength pulse, very much like what would come from a solar emission. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a very high frequency nanosecond uh, not, uh, 10 to the minus 9 seconds wet wide, high amplitude pulse, a spike, a shock, uh, which is what destroys uh, your little computers that are in your cell phone and in your car and other things. And that comes from a high altitude burst. Doesn't have to be a big yield. That's another myth in this game. There's a mythology that you have to have megatons of energy to create EMP. I like to tell people I worked with Sam Cohen uh, in the 1970s, and he was the guy who invented something called uh, uh, an uh, enhanced radiation weapon in the 1950s at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. The first application of that was the Sprint missile, which was an interceptor deployed with our safeguard system in the mid-1970s. And um, then also in the 1970s when I was working with him, he was an advocate of something called the neutron bomb. Anybody here remember what that was? It was to be deployed on the Lance missile. You know what the Lance is? You know what that is? It's not a big missile. It's deployed in Europe, and the idea was that we would defend against the Russians coming through the Fulda Gap between East and West Germany at the time. Uh, and it would kill the people inside the tanks, even though you wouldn't kill the tank. You wouldn't destroy infrastructure in the cities and so on. You would kill the soldiers. That's what you would be going after. Um, for political reasons, that was not deployed. If you want to read about that, you can go to our web page. It was in my message last week because I was, I was arguing with the then public announcement that don't worry about the North Korean test because it was just a little low yield weapon. Wouldn't create any problem. Well, the weapon that was to go on front of the, uh, the Lance missile had a range of yields possible between one kiloton, that's uh, less than, uh, 13 kilotons is what was dropped on Hiroshima. This is a gauge for you. Uh, up to 100 kilotons, quite sufficient to create the EMP pulse. Uh, we also know, because Russian generals told the commissioners uh, the EMP Commission on, in 2004, I believe it was, that uh, the North Koreans had somehow gotten their hands on the design of the Russian super EMP weapon, which I believe is probably an enhanced radiation weapon of this sort. So the North Koreans have the design capability, uh, or they know the design, if they wish to build a low yield uh, device that would create EMP. So what you're being told by the press is not a, not a 
clean story on that front. Uh, and it's still troublesome. There are several ways that uh, scenarios you could imagine where the trouble, trouble could come. Could I go ahead? I can do this. The scheme down here on the bottom, the picture here, is just of what your grid looks like. You, if you look over to the left-hand side, you'll see what I refer to as uh, uh, nuclear power plants, and that's one of the main things I want to chat to, with you about. A connection of a bunch of long lines, that's what you see out on the highways when you drive the, the high power, high voltage lines. And then it goes down through a step-down transformer on the other end and is distributed to your homes and to businesses and so on. The low frequency component of EMP couples energy into those long lines and that energy then is transferred to those transformers on either end and they can be burned up in their current configuration. They aren't built in this country. If you lose those transformers, they have to be built somewhere else and transported here or we have to have spares. We don't have spares today. And they're built in Germany and South Korea, as I understand it. If you don't have transportation, you're stuck without help. And so we need a program that, uh, that stockpiles this kind of uh, capability. And there is some movement in the government and in the Congress to move in this direction uh, if the bills that are now being considered pass. Um, this chart shows uh, pictures of two of the classes of problems where the EMP threat can be delivered by missiles and satellites. On the right-hand side uh, is, uh, uh, with the stars is where I believe we should be deploying a system called Aegis Ashore. It's uh, basically the components that are on some 35 of our cruisers and destroyers now deployed around the world. Capability of shooting down ballistic missiles in uh, their ascent phase and in the mid-course phase where they're above the Earth's atmosphere. Today, we're completely vulnerable to a vessel that might launch a missile out of the Gulf of Mexico. And I believe we should deploy this kind of a system at three or four sites around the Gulf. Um, we're deploying, one is now in an operational, actually pre-operational capability while the crews are being tra trained, but the system itself is operational in Romania. And we'll have one in Poland in 2018. Uh, there is one that we use primarily for testing on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. Uh, no R&D is required to build these systems. You simply need to make it happen, and one of my objectives this year is to get back down to Tyndall Air Force Base and see if we can't get the people there who are responsible for defending the entire country against air attack to begin making moves toward putting such a site there. Why the government is not dealing with this issue, I can't tell you, but I can tell you the Missile Defense Agency has no such program. Uh, nor do I know any advocate in the government who is working for this, in spite of the fact a number of us have been talking about it for years. The left-hand picture shows you the trajectories of satellite launches out of North Korea and, a Quran, uh, and uh, Iran. Uh, they have both launched satellites that are quite capable of carrying the enhanced weapon that I, radiation weapon that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, as I recall, the Iranians launched a mon monkey into space in a capsule that weighed some 4,000 pounds. That's uh, two orders of magnitude more than, you, than is needed, was needed for the Lance missile. You don't have to harden the capsule against re-entering the Earth's atmosphere because you're going to de detonate it above the Earth. Satellites have been orbited over the United States from both Iran and North Korea. They come at us from the south. Now, we have designed our missile defense programs uh, against the Soviet Union originally, and then, uh, and then China and North Korea. And they are looking at missiles that come at us over the North Pole. And the back door is wide open. We don't even have very good uh, sensor systems to track. Uh, the, the threat. We'll, ha we'll get warning from a warning satellite system that's in geosynchronous orbit, but then in order to intercept the satellite, you need to be able to track it and pass that in information to an interceptor. Again, Aegis is capable of shooting down 
uh, low Earth orbit satellites. They demonstrated this in 2008 with the very first of their uh, interceptors. So we know how to do the problem, but again, we're not doing it. Government is, is failing at that. Um, I'm not sure which way I point this. Next chart, please. I want to talk to you now about how to get to the solution. This is a picture of the United States, the red dots. I used this last year. If you were here, you've seen it before. And uh, those are where we have nuclear reactors. We have about 100. I think it's 98 now that are actually operational. Most of them are in what is referred to as the eastern interconnect of the grid. Uh, that's east of uh, sort of a line that you would draw up from, the, uh, from Texas uh, to the Canadian border and the eastern seaboard. 20% uh, of the nation's electricity is produced by those reactors. Here in South Carolina, and tell me again, how many of you are South Carolinians? 60% of your electricity comes from nuclear reactors, and we're building two more in South Carolina. Georgia's building one. So, there, and don't get wrong what I'm saying. I'm an advocate of nuclear power. I just want it done right. You know, nuclear energy is clean energy for those who worry about that sort of thing. I frankly don't, but people who worry about that and the advocates of taking down the coal plants, which I'm not, uh, nuclear power can be a good thing. On the other hand, if you lose the electric grid, those reactors shut down and they shut down to protect themselves. They're under regulation to shut down if they don't go down automatically. And that's because without the load from the grid, the turbines that are driven by the, the fuel uh, will spin out of control. They don't have a load on them. It's like having a freewheeling uh, wheel and you just keep spinning it up higher and higher until it breaks. So the reactor shut down. And then the problem is how do you restart them? And without the grid, they don't restart. You need something on the order of 50 megawatts of energy to restart a nuclear reactor. Now, uh, they have diesel generators, to, but those generators at the plants are to provide cooling water uh, to the reactor core and also to the spent fuel ponds that are out in the neighbor, neighboring the reactors. And if you lose the power to those diesel generators, i.e., you don't have fuel because you can't transport the fuel because the trucks don't run or the, or the gas tanks don't run or whatever that depends on these SCADAs, these little computers, uh, then you're stuck after you run out of fuel and you've got the potential makings of Fukushima, if you know what I refer to there. That's the Japanese uh, 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 catastrophe several years ago as a result of a tsunami and an earthquake. Uh, but, th but then you've got radiation that can come all over the eastern seaboard. So it's a problem if we don't do something about the issue. On the other hand, uh, the nuclear reactors all have sufficient um, sources of energy, uranium sources of energy, to power themselves and for the surrounding grid for the better part of a year, if not longer. So if we can figure out how to make them viable in the, in the instance of losing the grid, they not only can protect themselves, they can provide power. I, I mentioned to you what would come there, 20% of the nation's power. 20% is a lot better than none. So you, you have the potential for rebuilding the grid if we can make the, the, the nuclear reactor systems viable. I believe this is what we should be doing first. I once oversaw all of the nation's um, communication systems for our strategic forces and the Air Force's uh, uh, missiles and uh, bombers and, and the command aircraft and so on. And we worked hard to make sure that system was viable against EMP, but we did nothing for the rest of the communication system. So the point I'm trying to get to here is that if we can figure out how to make the reactors viable, then we have a, a way out of this morass, okay? Now, the good news I have for you, how many of you get your electricity from Duke Energy? Folks up in the northwestern part of the state do, into North Carolina. Duke Energy is the largest power company, I believe, in the country. Uh, I have met through contacts at uh, Clemson, I'm wearing my tiger paws today, 
Um, I'm class of 58, so you can do the math. Um, in any case, I met with the head of the EE department and others, and, and as a consequence of that, took part in a conference that involved NC State, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and, um, and the energy companies from this part of the, the, uh, um, of, the, of the nation, not just Duke Energy, but others as well. But in particular, the Duke Energy people who are paying for uh, innovative work at those three universities and perhaps others to improve the resilience of the electric grid, uh, some individuals there have taken this issue on. And they have agreed to work uh, with me uh, on the Catawba River. Do you know where that is? Lake Wiley. Um, and uh, Duke Energy operates a hydroelectric plant there as well as a nuclear reactor plant there. The hydroelectric plant can be the source of energy to restart the reactor after it's shut down. It puts out in excess of 50 megawatts of energy. And so if we harden the connections between those two and we also harden at least a, 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 a region of the grid surrounding those components, we have the basis of a viable uh, energy source into the future to help the folks in South Carolina work other problems and in our neighboring states. In fact, the Duke Energy folk wanted to do something in North Carolina initially, and I persuaded them to, to do the Catawba Lake thing because I had a meeting there with the uh, Republican Women's Club who got enthused about this issue, and as a consequence, now Mick Mulvaney is on board with us, Congressman Mulvaney, whose district includes this, as well as Shaw, Shaw Air Force Base and others. Um, Jeff Duncan is on board and working these problems, as is Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson's particularly important. He has Columbia, uh, goes down to North Augusta, which is our home address on the farm here. And, um, and because he chairs the Emerging Threats Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. He's on board and is just waiting for a cue to engage others. What we need more than anything else at this stage to make this experiment that we want to do viable is to make sure that Duke Energy gets the support they need from the responder community, from the sheriffs, from the firemen, uh, from the National Guard. And I might say that your National Guard uh, Adjutant General in the state of South Carolina, Bob Livingston, is an electrical engineer, graduate of Georgia Tech. He understands what these issues are about. He knows what I'm trying to do and will support us. So this is all good news as far as I'm concerned. The only real question is, do we have time to make the problem uh, work? Uh, and I worry about that because I'm afraid we're led by folks in Washington who don't appreciate the seriousness of seriousness of the threat, nor do those in the media who are telling us there is no problem here, we have time. I worry we don't have time. I think we know our way out of the morass now, and I've discussed this uh, with a number of the candidates. I'm pleased that uh, Santorum and Carlson, I know that Ted Cruz is on board, I'm not sure about Donald Trump, but all of the candidates, either I or some of my colleagues, have briefed on these issues and hopefully we'll have leadership in the White House that will take it seriously and that Congress is waking up. Next chart. I, I think I've said everything I wanted to say, actually. Um, oh, this is just uh, pictures of the dam on the right-hand side on the Lake Wiley. Uh, the problem remaining requiring an invention for some of you folks who still are creative on that venture is how, how do you restart the electric the reactor when you still have the problem, you don't have the load of an entire grid on the outside because I just told you a moment ago that you have a problem um, that leads you to shut down the reactor in the first place when you lose the, the load. So um, we need an invention there. I hope some of our PhD candidates at these universities can give us an idea, but just to seed the thought, if you can't think of anything else to do, you can pump the water from below the dam back into the lake above the dam out of the reactor, and you can change that flow pattern as you restore the grid around the reactor and the other portion. Uh, that's not an uh, efficient way to do it, but it would work. I'm satisfied it would work, and the engineers at Duke Energy are satisfied it would work as well, and I believe we have something like that 
going on at their Oconee plant already. So next chart. I think I'm done, am I not? Yeah, that's a summary chart. I've taken up my time, so I don't want to take any more of other time here. I hope that Joe will have me back in a year and I can tell you of some real accomplishments with this program. Uh, I, am, I am pleased that we're making progress, but we're nowhere near there. Uh, I've described several cases along the way where the DOD is not paying attention. Most notably, Admiral Gortney, who chairs Northern Command, he's the commander of Northern Command out in Colorado Springs, he's spending better part of $700 million to reharden equipment inside of Cheyenne Mountain. If you, those of you who serve know what I'm talking about, that's, that's the hub of our communication systems for our strategic warning and strategic forces. And, um, and yet, he's not doing much of anything that I know about uh, to, uh, to protect the grid upon which your survival depends as citizens of this country. And yet, he's supposed to be responsible for North Carolina, you know, for, for homeland defense. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope I get back to tell you good news sometime we, in the future. We've got time for two questions. <laughs> Sir, you want to take a couple questions? Sure. Sure. I'd be happy to take questions. Once before, you said that it would take about $10 on everybody's electric bill to harden this grid or make it safer. Can you, is that still true? Uh, yes. I, money is not the issue. I didn't deal with that and what I had to say. One of the reasons I'm so pleased that Koppel is uh, going public with this, and he's making the rounds. You know, he's been on uh, Charlie Rose. He's been on all the talk shows on the media that I don't know about you, I usually don't watch. But, but he's spreading the word about the difficulties we have with the grid and how, how, to, how to, you know, what we need to accomplish there. So that word's getting out, and people are learning that we're not dealing with the issue, for, not just for cyber, but for all these other things. And when you start fixing one, maybe you should fix them all. You know, that, that's catching hold. The political issue has been the thing that has stopped us. Um, and the key individual in that regard has been a congressman uh, by the name of Fred Upton from uh, um, Michigan, I can't remember the district now. Uh, he chairs the Energy and Commerce Committee and for the last two Congresses blocked legislation that was to come out of that committee. Uh, he just sponsored legislation initially as a part of the transportation bill this year, by the way. Uh, rather than the energy bill, but in the energy bill itself, there's other legislation which includes components of uh, legislation that Peter Pry, do anybody know who Peter Pry is? Okay, a few here. <laughs> uh, Peter and several others of us, Frank Gaffney and all, have been trying to, to get started. Trent Franks, who is the uh, chairman of the EMP caucus, he's an Arizona Republican, um, has uh, tried for years to get this started, and, and he's delighted that Upton finally is beginning, maybe he's felt the heat, but he's beginning to see the light and is proposing legislation to move forward. Now the problem is the United States Senate. Uh, there are two bills to be considered in the Senate, right in this coming uh, Congress. They were there in the last Congress and weren't dealt with. And I might say that uh, Ron Johnson, who chairs the Senate uh, Energy, uh, Center, uh, Senate um, Homeland Defense, Homeland Security Committee is on board and wants these passed. And the problem, of course, in the Senate is one senator can block things, as has happened in the past. And um, so by, by bills that were passed unanimously by, uh, by the House. So we're not out of the forum yet. One of those bills is to simply require the uh, Homeland Security ho um, Department of Homeland Security to include among its scenarios EMP, cyber, and other threats to the grid. Today, it's not included among the scenarios that include uh, hurricanes and, uh, uh, you know, tornadoes and fires and all of that. There's a dozen or so that everyone in the government is supposed to be prepared for, including your uh, county officials and so on. So if that were to pass, and hopefully it will pass if the Senate goes along with it this year, 
uh, then everyone, including the sheriffs, will be on board in trying to work this problem, and, and hopefully that'll dovetail with what we're trying to accomplish up at Lake Wiley. Thank you.